Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a privilege that all of us have to worship the Lord today, so thanks for joining with us. As you continue to settle in and prepare to worship, let me remind you that our many adult Bible studies have resumed for this year, but it's not too late to join in. Our Monday evening group is looking at the parables of Jesus. Our Lacosta Glen women's and men's weekday groups are looking at Paul's letter to the Romans, and our Sunday morning group is looking at the Old Testament book of Exodus. You may be in touch to get more information or to sign up using the address that are on your screen. We'll be welcoming new members soon into the life of the church. If you are thinking about joining or would like simply to learn more about it, please be in touch with Neil Pressa and sign up for the Zoom seminar on the 7th of February. Now we are pleased to welcome representatives from Care House and to learn about the ministry that they are doing and that we are proud to be part of. CareHouse has had the opportunity to help San Diego's homeless population for over 20 years now. Throughout our time serving the community, there have been many different opportunities in which we have been able to work with schools, churches, and other organizations in order to expand our love. The donors that come back each month with assistance has paved the way for our kids to experience normal life, whether that be fundraising scholarships to private schools or sponsoring kids to go on trips. Without the countless support we have received, none of this would be possible. At the end of the day, our goal is to give these kids the opportunity to keep food in the fridge, happiness on their face, and love in their hearts. We give love so they're inspired to give love to others, keeping the idea of hope in mind no matter how difficult life can be. 450,000 people experience food insecurity every day in San Diego, and 177,000 are children. Our main goal for the upcoming year will be to expand our resources in assisting children with learning materials as we continue distance learning, as well as maintaining consistent food security for our families that continue to struggle. Above all else, please keep us in your prayers and God bless. And a special thank you to Village Church for partnering with us throughout these days of uncertainty and giving us the support we need in order to continue our mission in assisting these kids. One of the greatest privileges of being part of the body of Christ is the privilege of participating with him and supporting ministries like Care House or the many others that we are part of. If you'd like to learn more about those things, be in touch with Jan Farley. Now, though, let's take a moment to center, to focus, to open and to prepare to worship God as we hear these words from the 25th Psalm. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his decrees. Friends, let's worship God. Oh, it 
Christ died for us, the righteous for the unrighteous, so that we may have a relationship with God. The Apostle Paul reminds us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And James says to us, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins. Will you please join me in a prayer of confession? Let us pray. God of mercy, God of love, in humbleness of heart, we confess our sins. We forget to love and serve you and wander from your ways. We are careless of your world and put its life in danger. We talk of our concerns for others, but fail to match our words with actions. Lord, have mercy on us for the sake of Jesus Christ, the Lord. Amen. Brothers and sisters, here again, words of assurance. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves all of us. He willingly went to the cross that we might be forgiven and have life and life abundant. Live in that grace. Amen. Now may the peace of Christ be with you. Share that peace, knowing that many, many people need to hear how much God loves them and wants peace for them. Amen. When the music fades and all is stripped away, and I simply come Longing just to bring Something that's of worth That will bless your heart I'll bring you more than a song For a song in itself Is not what you have required you search much deeper within Through the way things appear You're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship Where it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it When it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus King of endless worth No one could express How much you deserve Though I'm weak and poor, all I have is yours, every single breath. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within, through the way things appear, you're looking into my heart And I'm coming back to the heart of worship Where it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it When it's all about you it's all about you, Jesus. I'm coming back to the heart of worship where it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it when it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. Good morning, children, and welcome to your kids' message. 
For this morning, we're going to continue talking about what it means to be responsible with the blessings that God has given us. Your story for this morning comes from the book of Matthew, and it's chapter 25, verses 14 through 30. We don't have time this morning to read each of those verses, so I would encourage you to pull out your Bibles at home and read this full story with your families. Your story this morning is summarized in what we call a parable. Now, parables were stories that Jesus would tell people so that it could help them understand the lessons that he was trying to teach them. Now, in the parable for our story this morning, it talks about three different people who received bags of gold from their master. Now, I have here this little bag, and inside this bag, I have this gold coin. So this would have been something that they would have been receiving with more gold than just one coin. Now, the first person received five bags of gold. The second person received only two bags of gold and the third person received one bag of gold. Now the master told them, now go and make an abundance of what I've given you and come back to me with what you have. The first person with five bags, he came back with five more bags. So he had 10 bags to give back. The second person with two bags ended up bringing two more. So he had four bags to give back. Now, the last person with the one bag, what did he do with one bag of gold? He dug a hole and he buried the bag of gold because he was afraid. When the master came and asked him how much he had made off of the one bag of gold, he said that he hid it because he was afraid that there wouldn't be enough left. This is an example of how God wants us to be with our blessings. He doesn't want us to dig a hole and hide all of the things that we have. He wants us to share the gifts and talents that he's given us for his glory. The master looked at this person and said, you know, I, I wish you would have done more. And God wants us to do so much more with the gifts and talents that he's given us. So that is my encouragement for all of you children at home. God has given you so many gifts and talents. And how can you use those this week to honor and glorify God? We miss seeing all of you. And again, we'll see you back here next week. Bye-bye. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. Was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. My chains are gone. Set free, my God, my Savior, ransom me, and like a flood, His mercy waits on ending love, amazing grace. Secures. He will my shield and portion be as long as life endures. My chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior, ransom. Amazing grace, my chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior, ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing
amazing grace The earth shall soon dissolve like snow The sun forbear to shine But God who called me here below will be forever mine You are forever mine You are forever In the sure and certain promise that in life and in death we belong to God, let us present ourselves, our prayers of thanksgiving and intercession to the living and gracious and loving God. I'll offer a pastoral prayer on our behalf, and then I'll invite all of us to close with the words of the Lord's Prayer. Let us look to the Lord with faith, hope, and love. We lift up our eyes to the hills from where does our help come from? But from you, O God, who made heaven and earth, from the rising of the sun to the setting of the same, you are faithful and true. Meet us where we are, Lord, for you know us more than we know ourselves. You know our inmost thoughts. You know the depth of our soul. You know every corner of the earth, for in life and in death we belong to you. Give us words to pray, words of thanksgiving, as we praise you for your unfailing and unending love, for all the ways you provide and bless us, and giving us hope and peace in the midst of great challenges. We are a people broken and unfinished. So mend us, heal the world, where there is much illness due to the COVID-19 coronavirus and other ailments and addictions, human hearts prone to violence in words and in deeds. There is much grieving, in the midst of great loss. There is brokenness in relationships, in families, in communities, in churches, and in nations. Heal us, we pray. Comfort us, we plead. Bless Pastor Jack as he shares your word to us. Empower and enable the village church and all of your churches and worshiping communities in every place, in our collective witness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord of the nations, we entrust to you the Biden-Harris administration for all those serving in elected and appointed office and for all those who are entrusted with the power and authority. Humble them. Humble us. Remind them and all of us that you are sovereign. You are Lord. You are King of the nations. Fill all of us with your sense of justice, righteousness, and love. Heal our nation, we pray. A nation bruised but whole fierce and free, where we are divided, some eager to lift up blue flags and others red flags, cause us instead to lift up white flags, white flags of surrender to you, to surrender and humble our wills, our ways to you. You are the Lord of all. Merge mercy with might, that we would seek not the truth of power, but the power of truth that which comes from the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. We raise this wounded world into a wondrous one, rebuilding, reconciling, recovering, because you provide the light in the darkness. For there is always light if only we are brave enough to see it, if only we are brave enough to be it. In the one who is the light, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Christ to you, pray the 
Let us begin our time in the scriptures with a prayer for illumination. Please join me in prayer. Living God, help us so to hear your holy word that we may truly understand, that understanding we may believe, and believing we may follow in all faithfulness and obedience, seeking your honor and glory in all that we do. Through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. From the Gospel according to Matthew. All who exalt themselves will be humbled, and all who humble themselves will be exalted. Now a reading from the letter to the Romans. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. The word of the Lord. Sometimes it takes a crisis to create a change. Let me say that again because I want you to get that idea. Sometimes it takes a crisis to create a change. Think about some of the lessons that we learn from life. A middle-aged man has a heart attack from out of the blue and fortunately survives it, but then goes in to see the doctor and the doctor says, you need to change your lifestyle or I need to fix some of your arteries. That crisis can precipitate a change in that person's life. Sometimes we're suddenly hit with a lot of unexpected bills that we cannot afford to pay, and that crisis can create a change in the way that we manage our money. Maybe a pandemic comes from out of the blue, and all of a sudden we realize just how inadequate our medical systems are, or just how poor our planning has been. Hopefully, we create some changes. Maybe there's an attack on the capital of the United States of America. What kind of change might that crisis precipitate? It remains to be seen. I learned a long time ago that when a crisis happens, whether it's a personal crisis or a national crisis, we have a choice. We have a choice about whether or not we're going to learn and then change, or whether we're simply going to deny that a problem exists and keep on living in our dysfunction. I've learned a few things in my lifetime. I still have more to learn. I've learned that when 
a couple come to me and seek some counseling for their marriage, usually it's because there's been a huge crisis. They've had a, a huge fight, maybe a huge failure of some kind, and they come to me and say, what can we do about this? There's hope. If the couple walks in and says, help us to learn, help us to grow. I'm a great student of history, as you know, and one of the things that I learned is that after World War II, some of the nations of the world used that incredible crisis that killed maybe as many as 70 million people worldwide. And those nations learned that they could not keep on doing business the way they had been doing business. And so former enemies like Germany and Japan and Britain and France and the United States, former enemies learned how to get along a little better with each other. Well, how do we recover from a crisis? What do we do when we want to step away from the brink of destruction? If you've been watching the news at all, as I have been watching it probably too much, <laughs> I hope you've observed, as I have, that when a huge crisis occurs, one of the first things you need to do is sort of go back to the beginning and say, hey, wait a minute, what are we all about? What are we trying to do here? Where have we gone wrong? Let's look at that and, and try to learn from where it was that we were one time going right. Politicians everywhere, news pundits everywhere, people in their normal conversation everywhere are talking again in the United States about what it means to be the United States. And as much as I'd love to visit with you about that, I actually want to talk about something much bigger, something that I think may help us get through all the many crises that we face in our lives, both the personal and the corporate ones. You see, we have a very clear sense in our country today that things have gone wrong. We could argue, of course, about what those things are and what we might do to fix them, but can you agree with me that not everything is as good as it could be? Many people have encouraged me to speak about specific things related to specific topics and in ways I have, but mostly what I want to talk about is what we learn from Scripture, what we learn from our faith. We live in a messed up world. We have lost our way. It's not the first time. It won't be the last time. But what I want to speak with you about is the way of Jesus in our wayward world world. And so today, and continuing through all the Sundays up until mid-May, yes, for a long time, we're going to be having a serious and sustained study and discussion and reflection within ourselves, if you'll go along with me, about what it means to follow Jesus in the world. We're going to be looking at the 12th chapter of the letter to the Romans. And so let's start there. Let's start there. In the first 11 chapters, in the bulk of the letter to the Romans that Paul wrote, Paul talks about the sorry state of humanity and then what God does about it in that singular saving act of Jesus Christ. We could talk for a long time about all of that, and in our Bible studies, some of them we are. I would encourage you to read those first 11 chapters of Romans, and then keep reading them as we focus on the 12th chapter. You see, in the 12th chapter, there is a shift in Paul's thinking, in his focus, as is often the case in his letters Paul says, here's the terrible condition we found ourselves in. Here's what our amazing and loving God did about it. And now, what do we do with all of that? Therefore, therefore, 
Because God has saved and is saving us in the act of Jesus Christ, Paul says, let's change our lives. That same dynamic of crisis and change occurs. Humanity is in crisis. We can't get ourselves out of it. God gives the answer. He takes us out of that crisis in what he does in Jesus. And then it should precipitate change. It can precipitate change. The change not in God, not in Jesus, but in us. And so that's what we're going to be talking about. Paul says in the first two verses of chapter 12 that now we have the opportunity, and we'd better take it, we have the opportunity of presenting ourselves to God as a living sacrifice, a sacrifice that is holy and acceptable. This is our spiritual worship. In all of that, we are going to find and we are then going to live by what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We are not going to be conformed anymore to the way of this world, what I have called the wayward world, but instead we're going to be transformed into the way of Jesus. All of that, of course, is because of the mercy of God. It's possible only because God offers it to us in his grace. It's possible only because God gives us the power to do it through the gift of his spirit. That fundamental dynamic, if you will, that we then offer ourselves to God and God begins to change us as we continue to offer ourselves, that will be the basis of everything else we're going to be talking about for the next three months or so. What then follows in the rest of chapter 12 are suggestions or commands or observations about the specific and actionable and measurable things that we have to learn and that we have to do if we're going to learn the way of Jesus in our wayward world, a way that actually works. And I would propose to you the only way that works. We're going to take each item on the list The first item on the list, as Paul begins to describe it in verse 3, only verse 3. He reminds us that it's by God's grace that he is sharing this with us, that it's by God's grace that he even knows about it, and it's by God's grace that, that God gives us faith in order to accomplish it. Again, it all begins with God, but just beginning is not enough. It has to keep going from there. What does Paul say? What is the first thing that Paul mentions? Paul says, I encourage you, I urge you not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment. Let me give you a one-word summary of that phrase. It's the word humility. The very first thing out of his mouth as Paul is reciting this letter, maybe he edited it, maybe he didn't, we don't know, but the very first thing that he chooses in the list after we say, okay, God, you've saved us, we thank you for that, now let's figure out how to live life the way you want us to live life, and we're going to present ourselves to you so that you can accomplish that change in us. The very first thing that Paul mentions is humility. Why do you think he did that? Why would he start there? Why wouldn't he start with saying, you know, I want you to be financially generous or or, I want you to develop more faith? Why does Paul start with humility? Was it because he was writing to the church in Rome? Oh, my heavens, writing to the church in Rome was writing to people who were part of uh, the, the, the world's most powerful city, the world's most powerful empire, at least as Paul knew it at that point. He was writing to people who perhaps were proud of their Roman citizenship, people who were proud that they lived in this center of the universe as far as anyone else knew. He was writing to proud people. Maybe that's why he mentions humility first. Maybe, though, 
Maybe Paul mentions humility first because Jesus talked about it a lot. In fact, Jesus modeled it. Jesus was talking to some scribes and Pharisees one time who were apparently very proud of their religiosity, and they took great pride and great pleasure in demonstrating their religiosity to everyone who was around them. In the midst of his conversation about them and to them and with them, he said, you know, all who exalt themselves will be humbled. Jesus was big on humility. And so we need to be big on humility. Here's actually why I think that Paul mentioned humility as the beginning of his list. It's because humility, in some sense, I think can be argued, is the basic answer, the first answer to our fundamental problem. Our problem is pride. Our problem is arrogance. Our problem is self-centeredness and self-worship. We think we can do better than God. That's what even Adam's answer was. And so the first thing God needs to teach us, the first thing we need to learn is humility, to say, no, we don't know. We are not the center of all things. Now, of course, there are many other aspects of the human character that has been transformed by Jesus that are necessary if we're going to live successfully in this world. But I'd argue that it all begins with humility. Let me make a few observations about humility to help all of us perhaps understand more about how it functions and the role it plays in our souls, in our psyches, and therefore hopefully in our societies. The first thing I want to say is that humility is important because we need to learn to look to the Lord first. Humility says there's something out there that's bigger than me, that's smarter than me, that's more competent than me, something out there that I need to learn from. C.S. Lewis once wrote that as long as you are proud, you cannot know God. A proud man is always looking down on things and people. And of course, as long as you are looking down, you cannot see something that is above you. Humility says there's something above us. Jesus himself is the model for that. As a human being, Jesus learned from the scriptures of his people. Jesus worshiped his God. He prayed to God the Father. He served God the Father. Jesus himself is a study in humility. So what if we learned to start every day by worshiping God? What if we learned to go through every day by worshiping God? What if we learned at the end of every day to worship God? The second thing I want to say is that humility teaches us that we might be wrong. We might be misinformed. We might, in fact, even be self-centered. Why is that important? Well, it's important because the human tendency in all things is to start with me. That's the way we are, and it's understandable in some sense. I wake up, and I'm still me. I wake up, and I still have me to deal with. And that makes me think that the world is all about me. Albert Einstein said that a true genius admits that he knows nothing. A true genius admits that he knows nothing. Albert Einstein said that. I think he knew more than I did about a few things, don't you? Let me tell you something. I am troubled with today's language patterns that have developed, and I think all of us, to some extent or other, are affected by it. I was taught that when you are speaking about something that involves more than just yourself, you begin with that other person, and then you go to yourself. You might say, 
John and I are going to go play golf. Or Mary and I are going to sit down and have a cup of coffee. But that's not the way we talk today. The way we talk, we reverse that. We say, me and John are going to go have some coffee today. Or me and Mary are going to go play some golf. Grammatically, linguistically, that's wrong. And that's one small issue. The bigger issue is that we always start with ourselves. Me is going to do this and me is going to do that. What if we learned that me might be wrong, me might be misinformed, me might be selfish and self-centered? Here's another observation. Humility says that I might have something to learn from someone else. Interesting thought. You see, we always know more when we listen to other folks. That's part of what Einstein was trying to say. The problem is that the human tendency, after we listen first to ourselves, because me is more important than thee, the first thing that we learn is that after we've listened to ourselves, then we want to listen only to those who agree with us. So much easier that way if everybody would just align their thinking according to the way that I think. That's the way that we are. But humility teaches that me and everyone else who's just like me doesn't teach us much. Go back and study the stories of Jesus. Jesus talked about half-breed Jews. He talked about women and children and Gentiles and Roman soldiers who were the hated oppressors. He talked about collaborators with those Roman soldiers. And from all of them, he taught examples of true faithfulness. Jesus went to those who were on the other side of things, those who were not like him or like all those to whom he spoke. Humility teaches us that perhaps we have the most to learn and then the most to gain from those who are not like us. What if men and women agreed that they could learn from each other? What if young and old agreed that they could learn from each other? What if straight and gay or Republican and Democrat or tall and short, whatever, what if we all learned we could learn most from those not like us? How about if we learned that people who wear expensive designer dresses to inaugurations may have something to learn from those who wear homemade woolen mittens? Another lesson we can learn about humility is that as we learn from others and as they learn from us, that we grow stronger. So many times now in the way we think of that concept of humility, we think of it as weakness or timidity or cowardice or some ridiculous thing like that. But that's not what humility is. Humility is about learning to become stronger, learning to become bolder, learning to become more courageous as we learn more about the truth and learn to follow that truth that we learn from each other. When the United States of America was being created, there were a lot of strong-willed people who fought tooth and nail about how to do it and when to do it and what to say as we created the documents that founded who we are. But they created something strong and lasting and good. As scientists get together to discuss and describe what a, a virus is like and how best to fight it, we do it best if we actually learn in humility from what others say is the truth and then look at what the science actually says. When the church was being created by its founders, it went through all kinds of arguments and still is about what's the best way to be the church. You see, as we learn from each other, we learn to grow strong. Let me suggest that we can even learn from ourselves. And that takes the ultimate humility to say that I was wrong and I am learning from my mistakes. George Clooney, the actor, said one time, he said, I watch my old movie, Batman and Robin, from time to time. It's the worst movie I ever made, so it's a good lesson in humility. And Amanda Gorman, 
who described herself as a skinny black girl raised by a single mother in the poem that she read for us at Wednesday's inauguration included this line. She said, and yes, we are far from polished, far from pristine. She's right. It takes humility to say that. It takes humility to begin to learn from that where we need to polish a little more, where we need to clean up a little more. We learn from our mistakes and we learn from the lessons of others and we all get stronger. The last thing I want to say is that there's no way to get to that place where we are living in the power of God without going through the doorway of humility. We want to live in the perfect presence of God. We want to live successfully, powerfully, well. We all want that. Everyone on the face of the planet wants that. But we have to learn first humility. You may be asking yourselves why I'm standing here next to a bunch of crucifixes. Protestants usually don't use a crucifix. We like the cross without Jesus on the cross because we say Jesus is not on the cross anymore, and that's true. But it's also true what our Roman Catholic and Orthodox cousins in the faith say when they say, remember that Jesus hung on the cross. We cannot forget that. We cannot forget that because it's an expression of the humility that Jesus himself experience the humility that Jesus modeled, the humility that, that Jesus had in his own life. He was humbled as he was convicted as a common criminal. He was humbled as he allowed himself to be stripped naked without even these little loincloths that you see here. He was humbled as he allowed himself to live an ugly death in front of everyone. He was humbled as he gave up his power to save himself so that he could save us. As Philippians reminds us, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Friends, we cannot worship ourselves, we cannot worship our ideologies, we cannot worship even our religions. It's only as we become humble and learn from him who was humble, and as we learn from others for whom he died, that we begin to move towards heaven. Andrew Murray said that pride must die in you or nothing of heaven can live in you. Indeed. I'd like to speak a lot longer, and I've gone a little bit longer than I normally do on these Sunday mornings. But let me say just one more thing. Let me say that this is the best sermon you'll ever hear about humility, and this is the best preacher who's ever preached that best sermon. Wait a minute. Maybe not. Maybe not. Let's keep learning from Jesus and from his humility. We have a long way to go, but he's with us. He'll help us. We need each other's help. I need your help. You need mine. We all need the Lord. Let's learn together. Amen. In response to God's word proclaimed, let us affirm our faith through the sacred words of Philippians chapter 2. In one voice and in one heart, let us affirm the faith. Christ Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name. So at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess to the glory of God. Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. in the darkness of the land.
brings to our senses when a nation's life turns sour. In the discipline of freedom we shall know his saving power, the living God be praised. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. The living God be praised. When a thankful nation looking back has cause to celebrate those who win our admiration by their service to the state. When self-giving is a measure of the greatness of the great, the living God be praised. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Right before Paul launches into his discussion of how we are meant to change, he concludes that earlier first section of Romans and its discussion of the human problem and God's answer with these words. Paul says, for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Indeed. From him and through him, from God and to God and through God are all things, all glory be only to God. That's where humility begins, is worshiping God as God and then letting everything else fall into place. May God be with us all as we learn humility. Amen.